Welcome back guys. Well today I'm here in the woods to chat a little bit with you about wildlife forensics, specifically hair. Stay tuned. So last time I was out in the woods I found a coyote den uh, with lots of sign around it, lots of feces and urine and hair. And so that made me think a bit more about wildlife forensics. So wildlife forensics is the application of science um, to gather information regarding a case involving you know, a death of an animal um, you know, that may have had an illegal uh, demise. Um, wildlife forensic techniques can also be used you know, just in research to determine you know, what species has been present in an area, what, uh, what has an animal been eating, things like that. So samples can be analyzed not only from things like hair, but bone and teeth, stomach contents, and even feces. So today let's talk a little bit more about hair. So in and around the coyote den I found lots of their hair. So hair and dogs they have the undercoat, uh, a lot of breeds have an undercoat as well as big long stiff guard hairs. So hair is made up of a protein it's called keratin and uh, you know hair in animals is really important and it's what makes us mammals. So I'm going to take a sample of this and I want to show you what hair looks like under the microscope and we'll talk about how the hair is made up and also how you can use it to differentiate what species uh, that we're dealing with. Some wildlife biologists also use hair um, you know in barbed wire traps so basically they'll just lay down just a line of barbed wire um, you know near a food pile or something and if an animal kind of goes around it or under it some of the hair comes off and you can actually use that to um, you know for identify the species that's there. Also you can um, find out the genetic makeup of the animal um, by using um, you know some of the sample from the hair the uh, the root of the hair contains uh, important DNA so that we can determine a bit more about the individual and uh, its genetic background. So let's go inside now and uh, look at hair under the microscope where I magnify it for you and we talk about the different characteristics of hair and how we can use it to identify what species we found. As stated earlier hair is made up of a protein called keratin. In this diagram you can see the hair shaft itself is structured into an outer layer called the cuticle, the cortex and the medulla which is a central part of the hair. It has a root that's located within the skin itself and the shaft is made of dead cells. Animal hair has many types including stiff guard hairs, fluffy undercoat and whiskers. The cuticle is made up of scales and is on the outer layer of the hair. It can be very useful in determining the type of animal species you're dealing with. There are three types, coronal or crown like is in this diagram, imbricate where the scales are flattened along the surface of the hair, and spinous where it looks like a flower petal. Coronal scales are shown here and can be seen as an example in fine rabbit fur. Spinous scales will stick out from the hair shaft itself and are found in some species like cats and mink. They kind of remind me a bit of some scales on snakes. Imbricate scales look flat and they overlap. This is a very common pattern in the animal world. In the cortex part of the hair it contains the color pigments you see in the fur as well as other elements. Human hair typically has pigment towards the outer part of the hair shaft, the cuticle, while in other animals it's toward the middle of the shaft near the medulla. If you find fur that has been dyed however you'll notice color pigment directly in the cuticle. The medulla is a central part of the hair and it contains cells. In some species there is air in this region. To identify particular hair using wildlife forensic techniques there's a lot of information that goes into the final determination of where the hair came from. Certainly looking at the hair when you find it you can tell a lot from it from the size of the hair including its length, its width and its color, what the root looks like and what the scale pattern is like and what the medulla looks like. There are lots of books out there and online resources that give you all the specifics for each different species uh, and this is sort of uh, used to identify hair. A while back at the cabin I found a kill site of a deer um, got chased out onto the ice and was killed. So I grabbed a sample of hair and I want to show you that as well and I also want to contrast that with another deer species, the moose, to show you the difference between the two. So sometimes if the animal is you know unrecognizable you're just finding you know like part of a pelt but there's no obvious body parts or skull to determine what it is. The hair can be really instrumental in determining what kind of species you have especially when it comes to the deer family because there are subtle differences. Here's a deer hair uh, from white-tailed deer and this was taken uh, from the kill site. 
Deer hairs are readily distinguishable by the thickness and coarseness of the hair. They tend to be thicker hair than say, for example, from a coyote or a rabbit. And the hairs tend to be the same thickness throughout most of the length of the sample. In this picture, you can see the hair of a white-tailed deer under the microscope. You can see the interesting pattern of circular cells that fill up the medulla. The scale patterns look fish-like in nature, so imbricate scales in the cuticle. Deer hairs from the white-tailed deer tend to be 100 to 300 micrometers wide, and if you can think about how small a hair is, a micron is 0.1 of a millimeter. So we're talking really small here. If you count the scales between each measurement of 100 microns in this photo, you get around 3 to 7 scales. Another interesting fact about deer hair is that it's very pointy root bulb and the cortex is rarely visible. However, if you take a look at moose hair, it tends to be a lot wider, it tends to be from 2 to 400 microns wide, and will have smaller scales per 100 micrometer distance, so usually 3 to 4 scales uh, per 100 micrometers. The cuticle is similar between the two, so it has an imbricate or flattened texture. However, in elk, there's a little bit of a difference here. If you're to find elk fur, it's similar in size to deer hair, but it has 3 to 10 scales per 100 micrometers. Taking the coyote fur that I found from near the den, we'll compare it to two other fur examples that I have, including domestic dog and arctic fox hair. First off, we'll notice that the coyote hair uh, has some points of pigment and some areas of white when we look at it. Coyote and wolf hairs usually have a black tip and it sort of alternates black and white and this can be very helpful to distinguish between the two as um, the white band after the black tip and coyote hair tends to be a lot smaller um, in length compared to wolf guard hair. Under the microscope you can see that the cuticle is imbricate and the hair itself is smaller than the deer hair that we saw earlier. You can see that the coyote for the guard hair is about 104 micrometers wide. And generally speaking, the guard hair width in wolf and coyote is less than 200 micrometers. I want to show you an interesting feature of fox hair. In particular, here we have arctic fox hair that makes it distinguishable from wolf and coyote and dog. And that at the base, you can see it has really spiny scales. I think that's really cool. Um, that's the thing I noticed right away when I looked at it, that it was very different from the coyote hair that I had. The scales in foxes tend to be spinous toward the base and the fox hair tends to be visibly shorter than wolf or coyote. Now distinguishing dog hair from coyote or wolf can be pretty tricky, especially if you're looking at hair, for example, from a husky or malamute. I mean, usually dog hairs are unbanded and the pigment extends all the way to the root and they don't have that sort of spiny um, scales that we see toward the base of fox hair. Let's take a peek at what some other fur looks like under the microscope. One of my favorites here is beaver hair. Look at this guard hair and how shiny it looks as light reflects off the guard hair. It really looks quite oily. The scales on the surface of the beaver fur are very tiny and layered, you know, with imbricate scales. Here's a picture of the domestic cat hair. It has a very interesting medulla that's characteristic and the structure of the cells inside of it looks a little bit like a ladder. It also has some spiny scales on the cuticle, which you can see a bit in this photo. It can be color banded, especially if you have tabby cat hair. And typically the roots of cat hairs look a bit frayed. I have some skunk hair here, and this shows the flattened small scales in the cuticle and the pigment distributed throughout the hair. I believe this was the black section of the skunk fur. The raccoon looks a little bit like coyote, fox, and wolf hair, and it's banded in color. Under the microscope, you can see flattened imbricate scales on the surface and patches of pigment throughout the cortex, but it doesn't have the petal-like scales at the base of the fur in the guard hair like you would see in the foxes. Let's finish up by looking at sheep wool. It has a natural crimp to it when you look at it in your hand, and under the microscope, you can see the rough scaly surface of the hair and an imbricate pattern to the cuticle. Remember, if the wool is from a clothing sample and not from an animal, dye can be found within the cuticle. As you can see from the pictures here, there's lots of things to consider when identifying hair for wildlife forensics. Certainly how the hair looks grossly to you, how it looks under the microscope, very specific measurements, sizes of the scales, size of the medulla, the different types of scales and color distribution are really important in identifying hair. There's so much to learn. Hope this gives you appreciation for what it's like to analyze hair when you're doing wildlife forensics. 
I was thinking sometime in the future, maybe uh, if I did more series on this, at the end of it I could do uh, a bit of a murder mystery case, like a little uh, a little game that we could play uh, regarding this to help solve the mystery and then after that perhaps uh, you know we can you know I can give it a prize or something like that so let me know if you guys want to do a uh, wildlife forensics murder mystery a uh, little fun that we could have on the channel put a comment down below if you're interested thanks so much for tuning into today's episode guys I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit about wildlife forensics I hope you learned a little bit more about what hair looks like and how we can use it to determine what kind of animals are around us hope you guys have a great week as always take care